Welcome, everyone, to the Sasquatch Outpost podcast, episode 15. We have a special episode tonight. I'm your host, Jim Myers. Been looking forward to and preparing for this episode for some time, several, a couple of months anyway. And uh, we've got, uh, let me just see who's in our chat real quick. We've got Sibylla. Hey, Sibylla, glad you're here for this episode. We've got Uncle Bones is here, John Ayers, Kevin Harder, Wayne Wasika, Patricia, as always. <laughs> and thank you for the super stickers, Patricia. So I'm hoping we're going to have a great crowd tonight. This is, this is a really special occasion. And uh, I just want to give you a quick in intro to how this is going to work tonight. This is going to be a longer than normal episode, and the uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have, I'm going to bring our guests on in a minute. I'll introduce each one of them. We're going to have, the first half will be them talking about um, their part in this project, and a little bit, a little bit the Erickson project that predated um the Sasquatch Genome Project, but was was part of that process. And I'll give all four of our guests opportunities to talk. I'll have some specific questions for each one of them. And then we're going to take a very short bathroom break if you need it. We'll come back for our second half, and we will open it up for questions. Now, I've I've got some questions for our our different guests but the i know that there's going to be a lot of questions from the from those of you who are in the chat room so be thinking about it any of our guests you can ask them a question and i know that there's been a great deal of controversy around the sasquatch genome project and i've already gotten some very shall I say, interesting emails in the last couple of weeks that have not blessed me, some of them, I'll be honest. And so here's the ground rules for this evening for our chats and questions. I'm asking everyone to be respectful of our guests, be respectful of the, the effort that, that went into the Sasquatch Genome Project, whether you agree or disagree with the results is beside the point. If someone comes in and is just intent on creating havoc or trolling, you'll get blocked, and that will be it for you for the evening. So I have two gals um, helping me this evening as moderators. They're both going to be vigilant to watch what's going on, and the, uh, the, the chat will hopefully stay positive and, and informative. My, my hope for this evening, the reason why I pulled these – four people together is that for those who are very familiar with the project, you may hear some updates. For those who don't know anything about the Sasquatch Genome Project, that you uh, will learn about it, that you'll learn about the results that came out of it, and we'll let the results speak for themselves and you make up your own mind. Uh, whether you agree or disagree is not my concern. We're just trying to bring the science to bear this evening. So let me see if that's everything I had to talk about before we get started. I think that's that's it. So why don't we bring our, our guests, all four of our guests in. Um, I've got Dr. Melba Ketchum is going to be with us, uh, audio, audio only, just because of where she's located and the difficulty for her to be on camera. But she's here. Hi, Melba. Dr. Ketchum, Hi, I should you? say. I'm glad you were able to be with us. I appreciate you having me. Well, you you are, I was thrilled that you agreed to this interview this evening. I've got Adrian Erickson. Um, Adrian is a um, international bow hunter and businessman. He was the founder of the Erickson Project in rural Kentucky. Uh, Dennis Full, a um, longtime personal friend of mine, businessman, uh, Sasquatch researcher. He was one of the primary researchers at the Kentucky 
habituation project from 2005 to 2010, which was the Erickson project. Randy Brisson, retired mechanic, veteran Sasquatch researcher, and one of the contributors to the genome project. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to say more about Dr. Mel Dr. <laughs> Freudian slip there, <laughs> Dr. Ketchum's qualifications uh, a little bit later. But she's, uh, she is very qualified for what she did with this, this project. So. This is kind of a reunion for all of you guys. I don't think you've all been together since your press conference almost 10 years ago, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> the last time. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of you haven't even seen each other for several years. So having each other on camera is uh, um, some of us have become grayer since you last saw each other. So <laughs> that's <laughs> life. A little Go bit ahead, of gray on his chin, that's it. He's still young looking. He is young. <laughs> I know. He Indeed. is. But Adrian and I have both lost a lot young. of weight, so we got to give that up at least. Well, there you go. Good for you for losing well, weight. That's a great, that's a great novel, thing. You got to show your pretty face, sir. We don't know. Sure. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, can, you can see an, a picture on my Facebook, and it is taken this year. So. Okay. okay. So, so 10 years ago, not quite to the month, I believe it was in September 10 years ago, you guys had a press conference. You were joined by several others who are not with us tonight. Uh, I know, um, I know Rich Germo was there. Who are some of the others that were at the press conference? Um, JC Johnson, Webb Sintel, yeah, uh, Troy Hudson, um. Who else? Who am I missing, Adrian? Dave Besides Floyd. you and Dennis. And everyone kind of shared at that time about their own experiences with the Sasquatch people. That's how I'm going to describe them this evening, the Sasquatch people. And, um, of course, Dr. Ketchum was, was going through um, her results during the, the – uh, the press conference. So I've watched the press conference. I've read the paper. I've read uh, quite a few of the opposing papers, criti critics' papers, and I'll, I have some questions on those notes as we go along. And I'm going to ask some of those questions and give you guys an opportunity to answer. And then we'll see what questions come from the field, quote, field, or chat room at the second half. But I'm going to go first to, to you, Adrian. Now, I know um, this started for you with the Erickson Project. And it was a – habituation may not be the correct term, but it was a project in rural Kentucky. I won't give the location. But the, the goal of that project was to find positive – evidence for the existence of Sasquatch because of the frequency of the visits on this particular property. So um, can you tell us quickly, give us a little background on you, first of all, a little bio, and then we'll talk about how you got involved in the project. Well, I saw my first Sasquatch when I was, let me see, that would have been 59. So I would have been seven years old. And I did, and we had no idea. My two brothers and I we saw it. I mean, a, a big male, a big male eating grain out of a granary. And it was, the natives told us what it was. They said, there's not many, they won't hurt you, but that's what it was. So that's a, that. So later on, like every decade, I hunted a lot in remote areas. And so I had different encounters and it wasn't, I thought they had kind of, you know, I it put it out of my mind. I thought eventually nobody's going to prove nothing anyways. And, uh, and they're going to become extinct before they're ever proven to exist. Mm -hmm. And then I saw one cross the highway when I was driving just before dark, going out into the mountains of, um, you know, between Alberta and British Columbia. And that got me back interested. And I got up, I became an investigator as Dennis was for the Bigfoot Research Organization. And when I was talking to all these different people, they were, they were happy that he could talk to somebody who didn't think they were crazy, who had actually had encounters with Sasquatch themselves. And then <clears throat> the situation came 
were we heard about what was going on in Kentucky and it was it looked like a great opportunity so I jumped I flew out there and that's what started because it was a great opportunity had it not been involved for one of the people there we could have we could have really had great success or we had good success we could have had great success and then I brought <clears throat> I couldn't spend my time there so that's when I brought Dennis involved and also uh Leela Hatchick, a scientist, to kind of basically to try to, you know, to keep it, you know, certainly, if, you know, to add credibility to it and try to prove to the world these things exist. But anyways, we had successes and we had failures, but uh, uh, had they been more, should I say, moderate or more open-minded people that we were involved with, uh, certainly we would have had greater success because the opportunity was great. Yeah. And you did come up with um, quite a bit of actual footage and evidence, Hours. both audio Hours and video. Yeah, audio, video, I mean. And uh, a, a few of us um, are, are working with Adrian, a couple others, um, with Adrian and Dennis, and we're, 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 looking into the possibility of doing a documentary film on that project because many people don't know about it, don't know what happened, don't know the actual evidence that came out of the Kentucky project. And, um, and Adrian, you, uh, after the, the, the project initially lasted about five years, correct? In Kentucky. Sure. That's right. And then I, I ran into financial difficulties, but I mean, it was the, the project for all purposes. Dennis is the project. I mean, he was there. I mean, Leela was, <clears throat> excuse me, between the two of them. But I mean, Dennis was dedicated and I found out afterwards he missed his son's graduation to be out there to try it at the and I, I was sick when I found out about it. And uh you know, to put up what Dennis put up with those people was 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 just terrible. And we just we had to basically pussyfoot around, you know, dealing with a narcissist, and uh, it was not easy. It was not easy. Well, as is often the case, uh, great research was hindered by uh, people. We we tend to be the biggest hindrance to Sasquatch research. It's not the Sasquatch as much as it is us. So that, that was certainly the case with your project. But nonetheless, you guys did come up with quite a bit of, of evidence, which hopefully we can do a good job eventually of presenting that story to the world, and we'll see how that, how that goes. But uh, Dennis, you were, you were key involved in, in the Erickson Project. You spent time living there coming going back and forth from Colorado is that correct yes yeah and um, and I know uh, you had some personal encounters while you were there how many times how many encounters would you say you had personally in the five years you were involved boy it's hard to it, it's hard to come up with a number Jim just because it was I don't want to say daily, but it was unexpected many times. So, you know, I'd be doing something mundane around the properties. We were working two different properties there. And okay. um, it, was, it wasn't it was just at night you, we would have activity. It would be, you know, I like to, I, I think uh, I came up with the term, a lot of people believe Sasquatch are primarily uh, nocturnal. But I think they're more cathamural in their activities were, um, at least in Kentucky where we were, um, it, it was unpredictable. It could be any time during a 24-hour period that you would have, you know, some activity. Um, but I guess that, that could be highly dependent on the area and the Sasquatch that you're dealing with. But that's one thing that Adrian and I learned there is that um, you just never knew. I mean, it was just, uh, you, you always kind of had to be on your, you know, be ready for something to happen. Now, having said that, it wasn't like it was always going on and always, you know, sure. stuff happening there. It was, uh, you know, a project like that, what was interesting about it was we would, we would go in for 
you know, I would go on for a week, two weeks at a time. Um, I would spend as much time as I could there. And there'd be three, four, five days at a time that we just get no action. And then suddenly out of the blue, it seemed like they'd come around and they'd be around and we'd know it. I mean, they, they would let us know, um, but we would know that they're around in the area. And the people we were working with that Adrian mentioned earlier, they would also tell us when they would, they felt like they were around or um, then they would mysteriously be gone and there'd be no activity for it. Yeah. Today. But it was not predictable. And that's one thing I think anyone that's done this for any period of time has learned that they're just not predictable. And that's part of what makes them so mysterious and elusive, right? Yes, so. absolutely. And any of us who've done this for a while, we know that we can never guarantee that they'll be anywhere or that they'll decide to show themselves. There is there is one one clip just for for the sake of those who aren't familiar with the project um, that uh, I'd like to show. And maybe uh, you, Adrian or or Dennis, you can comment on it as we put it up on the screen. But um, go ahead and put. So that was that was a night vision camera, obviously. It was a PVS-14 um, at the time in 2000. I believe that video was taken in 2008, if I remember correctly. I, I haven't gone through my timelines in a while, so forgive me if I'm not exact on the date. I can look them up. But um, we had outfitted them with a PVS-14 uh, night vision device, and then and a uh, Sony high definition camcorder. And um, anyways, what he said is, he said this thing was approaching the back of his uh, garage where it was unlit. And he he saw it approaching and he turned the camera on, by the time he turned the camera on, it saw him in a darkened garage behind a window. And he stood back from the window a little ways, but it still saw him. Hmm. And it spun around in a three, you know, 180. It was, it was approaching the garage. It spun around and just started walking calmly back the other direction. By the time we got the camera on and we got it recording, that's what we see. And it walks down. And it's, it's kind of a grade there on the back of their property. And unless you're there, you can't see it drops off significantly to a hollow in a tree line back there. And it, um, it, it walked down a little ways and it turned to the left. And then it just froze up and it stood still. And once that happened, I mean, we could see where it stopped. It was behind some tall weeds. But when it stopped, you lost all visibility. I mean, you couldn't really know that it was there unless you watched it, you know, stop where it did. So it blends in real well. But um, it was remarkable. I think that encounter, one of one of a lot, in you know, many, um, was remarkable to me because according to uh, the guy we were working with, he said it saw him in this darkened garage at 11 at night. It's dark. Yeah. And it reacted to him. And I thought, you know, that's amazing that it, you know, that it's night vision is so well that it can see through a window into a darkened garage. And so, and it was, and it was, you that. said it was walking downhill, which kind of explains why it looks like it has short legs because you can't see yeah, the full you can't length see of the, the legs. Lower part of the leg. It's already going over the crest of the, this little hill. It's, it's quite a significant drop off. And then, of course, there's, you know, tall grass. And he mows it once a week. But, you know, it grows up quick in Kentucky. If you know Kentucky, it's the jungle. Yeah. I mean, it literally is very, uh, very heavily, you know, wooded and a lot of, a lot of grain. So it's, um, you know, anyway, but that's what you see is it's dropping off back behind the hill. Hey, Steph, let's show it one more time now that people know what we're looking at a little bit more. So she was, she what? it was the female, you think, right? Uh, I can only assume to, uh, you want to think that Adrian and I have seen in there, um, you know, a number of times, and 
we believe there was four individuals on that property that were regularly visiting. Uh, mainly, it was a very young juvenile that was between, I want to say, three and a half to four and a half foot tall. Uh, two females around the six foot range, and we assume they're females merely by the body shape, like that one. The hips seem to be wide and a little, you know, have a more of a female shape to the body. The shoulders aren't as broad. And then there's a large male that um, I. I have not personally seen the large male, but he's been witnessed by others. Okay. And he had the typical description of football, wide, linebacker, shoulders, seven and a half feet tall, just enormous, just very intimidating. And, uh, but again, mostly the encounters I had while I was there was with, I believe, to be the two females and uh, the, the younger juvenile. But, that I believe the one that we witnessed here is probably one of the six foot females. And the reason I say that is not only from the body shape and the hip structure, but, and the shoulders too, the shoulders aren't as prominent, but Layla and I went out the very next day after that footage was taken. And we worked with the guy that was there, we were able to determine, we knew where he filmed this footage and using that information, we were able to set up some measuring devices to determine a, a height. And the way we were able to do that is if you look at the video in a higher definition, there's, he, it walks down a mode portion of this hill and then it goes to a very tall weedy patch. And this, this patch of weeds that was not bowed had some tall weeds that, uh, I don't remember the height, but basically using one of those tall weeds that we could uh, determine where it was placed during the day, you know, we were able to gauge the height from the position of where he filmed it to where it stopped. And so we determined that to be, it was right around six foot, maybe a little, little over, slightly okay. over six foot. And that's a great example right. of how we can figure out height. Uh, if we know any of the landmarks near where a yeah. Sasquatch walks, we can determine height pretty well. Yeah. So, um, so you guys were involved in this project for five years. A um, lot of a lot of footage, a lot of which has never really been seen, and uh, and there's various reasons for that. We won't get into that right now, but the. Uh, I'm going to bring Dr. Ketchum in real quick here. Um, I mean, you're in, but I'm going to. Um, Dr. Ketchum uh, had her own laboratory, DNA Diagnostics, uh, for many years. They were involved in species identification. People would send in samples because they wanted to know what species of animal this was. Uh, but it wasn't just animals that they, they worked with. Um, they did human paternity. They did forensics. Uh, she worked on death penalty cases where, where evidence was, was presented that needed uh, DNA identification. And, and one of the things that interested me that I didn't know to recently is that Dr. Ketchum was involved in identifying remains from the 9-11 attack and um, so a lot of experience and, uh, several degrees behind her name. So, um, Dr. Ketchum, um, can you just tell us, and do you mind if I call you Melba during the show? No, that's fine. That's okay. fine. Um, tell, give us a little background on yourself and then, um, how the, the genome project kind of came to be, so to speak. Um, well, I'd had the lab for a long time. We were already, you know, well into <clears throat> forensics and animal testing of all different types, from paternity to trait testing. <clears throat> we also um, did human paternity. And so we did a variety of services at the lab, and one of them was the species identification. Um, I didn't even Sasquatch. I've said this before. I just thought it was a gross joke. Um, I would laugh like every other skeptic. I thought might there might be something in the Himalayas because it's so, you know, 
desolate up there. But I didn't believe anything could be in the United States as well covered with population as it is. <clears throat> so, in fact, uh, <laughs> I had a friend that had a sighting on my property and I actually made fun of her. I'm ashamed of that to this day. But I, I didn't know what she saw, and she described one perfectly. This was back in, in 1995, and it scared her so bad that she called me and asked me to come home from work, which I did, and she mm. was in the corner crying. She was so scared in her bedroom, had her two little girls tucked up under her. Uh, the thing had run across my front yard <laughs> wow. in daylight, and it was about 10 foot tall and bulletproof, and she tried to say it was a a giant hairy man with long hair and how fast it ran and da 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 and I was like, you must have seen a bear. Now there's no bears around here, let me tell you that. This area does not have bears. But I didn't know what else to call it. I mean I really didn't. I had no clue. So I joked, I said, and she did not use drugs, let me put it this way. But I said, What have you been smoking? What have you been yeah. smoking? <laughs> and so she got really upset with me and was so scared she wouldn't stay here while I was at work. So she Went back to her husband because she was here because of a divorce. And let me, uh, let me interrupt you just for a second, Melba. Um, we're gonna the questions you're asking, good questions. We're going to hold all those questions until the second half. So um, if if I don't ask any of any of the four to answer your questions right now, that's why I want them to get through some of these explanations first. So back to you, Melba. Okay. So anyway, fast forward into the lab and. We have people sending in these samples for animal identification or any kind of identification for that matter, just species. Sure. And so, um, and we did all of our, our due diligence. We had positive controls and negative controls and all the things that made it a legal test. And um, we would get these Sasquatch samples in and we'd laugh because we always got something like a goat or something. And we never got anything that was interesting. And so we would we get him. We got another Sasquatch sample. Ha ha ha! <laughs> and we'd run it, tell them what kind of common animal it was, and then, you know, a couple months later we'd get another one. So anyway, uh, fast forward till I believe 2008, um, we were asked to do some testing for Destination Truth, and we did. And one of the hairs didn't really look human. Um, and we got human sequence on it. So it was kind of hmm. the something to come, I should say. And so it kind of piqued my curiosity, but I hedged because I really didn't think it was a Yeti. I just thought, I mean, it was mixed in with some fiber. So I couldn't be sure uh, like I wanted it to be. And so they taped me and after that, a whole ton of samples started pouring in i mean over a hundred well over a hundred and was, was there was there a call that went out for samples or no they just saw it knew we would test it so here it came okay and um before this uh, about the same time that we had finished the destination truth samples uh david plighty sent in a couple of samples and one of them was an eyewitness sample the other one had mm. uh actually um had broken into a peacock pen, sat there and plucked the peacocks and, and then went back out the hole it tore in the chicken wire and it left footprints. So they were both pretty good samples and they were obviously not human. They, they were larger. It's more like horse mane hair if I had to describe it and it's wavy and it has one end that's not been trimmed in any way, of course. And then it's got the root end. Well, we didn't have very many hairs, uh, but we tested them. And here was this non-human hair that suddenly gave human results. Now, I tore the entire test apart. I re-extracted. I changed out brand new reagents. I did new controls. I did everything in my power to rule out human contamination, and it wouldn't go. It was still that way. And so that freaked me out because I'd never seen anything like that, and it's never been in history of genetic testing that anything had tested like that. So I called one of my authors um, that does hair analysis, forensic hair analysis. And, you know, we started getting these samples. I sent them to him and had him analyze them. And they were all unique. They were mm. all probably closest to bear hair, if you had to guess. 
according to him, but they were unique. And but they weren't, but they weren't bare hair. No, yeah. no, 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 they weren't. And every single one of them tested clean for human DNA. And I say clean in the fact that there were no contaminated hair samples because we can wash them. And being a forensic scientist, we're able to decontaminate anything that we can. And we're used to dealing with contamination, even if it's there in a sample we can't wash, because we've always had to deal with that in crime scenes. Okay. So we're experts in dealing with contamination. And these samples were not contaminated. And we were getting these large hairs that were given human DNA. And that's where the project was born, was because all of a sudden I had all these samples and they were uh, not running as expected. And a little ways in, in comes Adrian with his samples. And I have to thank him because he financed a lot of the project, him along with her, uh, Wally Hersom. And um, he was a, a real asset to our project. And between all of us, it all came down to having really good results. Um, all We weren't getting anywhere with the human part, which was the maternal part, the mitochondrial DNA. Um, and it was funny, everybody thinks they're Native American. Uh, most of it was Middle Eastern or hmm. European, which stems from Middle Eastern. So me, we only have... had like one or two samples that were Native American okay. uh, as far as their as their mitochondrial DNA. So we had to go to the nuclear DNA to see if there was anything there okay. that we could actually prove that there was a new species of some sorts. So I'm going to pause you there for a second. I got a quick thing I want to throw up on the screen, the uh, Genome Project um, PowerPoint there, Stephanie, just to give people an idea of what went involved, what was involved in this. So um, <laughs> good old Internet taking its time. Hmm. I'm surprised it's taking that long. It's not, at least it's not coming up on my screen. Do you guys see the PowerPoint on yours? Yes, I do. Okay, there it goes. Now it came. Oh, now I do. So the Genome Project, Sasquatch Genome Project, or SGP, was a collaboration by an interdisciplinary team of scientists from independent public and academic laboratories aided by volunteer researchers and supporters whose goal was to understand the nature of the indigenous aboriginal people in North America, commonly known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch, primarily through the study of their DNA. This is from uh, the paper that Melba and others wrote. So carry on down. So it was a half million dollar study when all was said and done. And the paper was published in the DeNovo Journal of Science in February 2013. And some of the scientists who were involved in this study and in writing the paper, obviously Dr. Melba Ketchum, uh, Dr. Veterinary Medicine, among other uh, qualifications, and carry on. I'll just let you all look at these names. I'm not going to go into it, but, but these were some very qualified people. And... Uh, who, who took part in this, who contributed to the paper. And then there were uh, 111 samples, eventually, that were sent in of hair, saliva, tissue, and blood from 14 U.S. states and two Canadian provinces. And there were a number of organizations um, listed here that, were, that contributed samples and then a whole list of individuals, so you can go on. You may recognize some of these names as she shows them on the screen, but uh, people who've been involved in research for a long time and who whose samples, and it's possible that some of these samples were contaminated, but I'll let Melba explain a little later how they removed that option of contamination. So, um, Randy, I'm going to go back to you here. Um, you submitted some samples. What were they, and how did you get those samples? Well, I think I submitted about uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, maybe 50, 60 hair samples from four different Sasquatch. Okay. 
reddish brown, uh, gray, black, and auburn. I think that's right, Melba. Yes. Yeah. But I think only I think only the redhead and the gray, if I remember correctly. Now I'm just pulling this off the top of my head. Actually, had roots where we could get DNA. That's right. Yeah. And and where did you find the hair? How did you come by these hair samples? Uh, well, we found some. Uh, what do you call it? Tree breaks and tree twists. And they're full of hair. You know, we really. The bush. Yeah, we go in the mountains. You hear them whooping and whistling and making all kinds of noise. You know. And we'd go in there maybe 15 minutes later, and my son would say, hey, look, there's a tree twist there. And there's we'd look at it, and it's full of hair. So we'd, you know, take it home, or we'd find it on branches and just uh, cut the branches, you know, dirt and all, and throw it in, in a little container and take it home. And, and now, when you would when you would find this hair, how, what made you think it wasn't just deer hair or elk hair or something else? Well, we, we always mostly would see the Sasquatch or hear them and okay. walk by the boys. So that's how we get it. Yeah. So you you were seeing them, sure, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, Dennis, I know you submitted one of the blood samples, and I would love for you to explain how you acquired that because a lot of people have asked me about that. Yeah, um, I wanted to, to just interject real quick. Um, the time I spent with Randy up there, we had several really intense, interesting encounters in his area. Yeah, and boy, if I could go back there more often, I certainly would have. But uh, I know that Randy and I both saw this red Sasquatch, and to me, it was a, uh, it was a, it was basically a flash through the tree, but it's very red. I mean, like people have described, very red in coloration. Um, but we both saw that, and I know Randy saw it more than I have. I saw it several times when I gone up there with him on different occasions. So I believe the one that he, the hair samples he got must have been from that one. And it looked to be a large male, at least. That, was that your opinion, Randy? Oh, yeah. I'd say about eight feet back then. Yeah. 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 He was, he was, he was, he was fat. Yeah. All I saw was the blur through the trees and red. And then, and uh, it was incredible. And I think we even got a short piece of footage of that too, Randy. Yeah. So but, it's good uh, to know that that you were there with him. You actually observed these oh, yeah. Sasquatch. Yeah, yeah, very good area that Randy has there. Very good. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of uh, the DNA that we collected, I mean, Adrian and I worked for the entire duration of that five years on the Kentucky project. You know, we wanted to try to gather evidence that we could, not just video. I mean, we had great opportunities, we felt, to get video evidence and audio evidence, which a lot of people collect. I mean, you know, in terms of uh, uh, what you can get from this kind of research, it's very difficult to, to get yeah. any of it day or night. And back in 2005 to 2010, even the technology was very limited, you know, in terms of night devices and we had to go to expensive military grade stuff just to have a, a chance to try to you know gather anything we could um stuff's definitely improved since then um you know in terms of thermal imaging and things like that and adrian funded the project very well with uh you know supplied me and leela who was our on-site biologist uh with good good equipment we we had a thermal imager and we had a number of high definition camcorders and um, you know night vision devices and audio gear but we wanted to also collect um, we knew that we besides getting you know what we could with video evidence which again was very difficult to get few and far between even though we may make it sound like it was easy it was not um, sure. we wanted to collect your typical spore that other people talk about your your footprints, your footprint castings, um, you know, uh, hair samples, which we did collect a number of them. And then during the process of this um, investigation, I don't want to call it investigation or habituation, it's more of a repeat visitation with this, with this couple. Uh, we were able to gather a lot of plates because she would put food out for these things. And I'm sure a lot of people heard about that. They called her the pancake lady. And <laughs> she um, would feed them pancakes. She would, yeah, she would feed them pancakes. And the story behind that was 
she lived she she lived outside of Cincinnati. She was it was a good almost hour drive from her work back home in northern Kentucky. And oftentimes she felt right. the need she had to feed. She, she had to do this. So she said that at times she, she couldn't make you know, pancakes at home or whatever scraps leftovers because she also gave leftovers from her food, you know. From, from preparing dinners or whatever. She would stop at McDonald's and uh, grab cheap pancakes. They were a dollar fifty, two dollars for, you know, three pancakes and it was cheap and quick and she would bring those over and leave them for her, her little pet, her hairy man, she called it. And uh, anyway so Sasquatch has a sweet tooth, obviously. She always loved and, and I'm sure a lot of people can attest to this. It loved the syrup, I guess, and the pancakes. But yeah, so that's where she got that that term, pancake lady. But because she was introducing food regularly to these um, to this little family group, we determined over time that perhaps the, the one of the easier routes to collecting some of that specific type of spore, hair samples, um, saliva, which they left on these plates when they would consume the plates. Now they wouldn't take them every time, but when they would, we, we felt pretty certain that they had consumed food we put on a plate. We'd go the next day, collect that plate, and um, we stored those, you know, leave the process and stored them properly so we could use those for future uh, potential DNA extraction. And, and uh, Dennis, let me just interject, were the plates, mm -hmm. where were the plates, I mean, were they on the ground, or where were they that you thought maybe yeah, it was a Sasquatch? Yeah, would leave them on the ground, uh, varying areas, depending on where she felt they were, uh, you know, in relation on the property. It's a big piece of property, and they weren't always in the same spot. They pop up in different areas, but that's part of the unpredictability of these, as many people know. Uh, but we would collect the plates. We would store them, we process them, and we did send, I don't know how many to Melba, but we sent some to Melba, we sent some to Thunder Bay, Ontario, to uh, DNA, I, I can't remember the name of the, of the lab off the Paleo top of my head, I don't know if you can answer it. Paleo Labs. Sorry? Yeah. Paleo Labs yeah, and Paleo NYU. Labs. Okay. And yeah. NYU also. Yeah, and, and unfortunately with that, um, we, we, we had a guy that we worked with there, his name was Stephen Scrat Pietro, I believe was how you pronounce his last name. Very, very accommodating guy, very good guy, nice guy. Very willing to work with Adrian and I and, and Lita to, to try to extract something from these potential DNA samples, but he just, it's very limited options yeah. there. Three, and, one, three, six, um, nine. And he's not along. Sorry? Um, no, somebody's got, uh, sounds like a walkie talkie or something, a radio in the background. Okay. Well, I, I guess we... to cut the, sto the story a little shorter. During the five years, we collected a number of plates. We collected hair samples, uh, some of them off plates, some of them off of bob wire fences, various areas that we knew that they traveled. And uh, those were also submitted with. Uh, saliva samples, but ultimately, uh, nearing the end of the project, we knew things were just getting difficult. So um, Adrian and I decided that ultimately, what we're going to need to do is try to collect something a little more substantive um, to yield better DNA results. Would and we thought about various traps. I, I'm sure you've heard of the. I, I can't remember the name of the lake up in northern Ontario where. Uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum and uh, Kurt Nelson worked where they had a nail board. Snowgrove, snow yes. And yeah. We thought about putting one of those up, but after uh, much thought about that, Adrian and I felt like that would be a little too brutal in terms of trying to collect uh, DNA, you know, and, and we did not want to affect the relationship between the couple, ourselves, the project. And these, this family group by entering them just to collect DNA, but we did come up with a with a plan that since we're introducing plates to them with food, we would put a small little device on a plate that would lacerate a lip or a tongue when they would clean these plates off of it. They would literally lick them off with their tongues to collect.
clean them when they really enjoyed one of the meals she put out. And you know, syrup is sticky, so they would just they, they would just have at it and clean that whole plate. And we put a little peanut butter and syrup on that plate uh, with some uh, not pancakes but bread, and they cleaned that plate off one night. I mean, we set it out a number of times. But the night that we actually got a good sample, that he cleaned it off that way, lacerated the tongue or a lip or something, which yielded just enough blood on that plate that we were able to collect it later. And then uh, Cleela processed it, um, and then we submitted that to Melba, and that I think was our best sample. Okay. So, and Melba, you you ended up receiving a few blood samples, right? That were believed to be from Sasquatch. Um, a couple, okay. but um, and it one of them was the New Mexico skunk sample. But yeah. it was contaminated with skunk, so I ended up finding hair on the pipe and used that instead because I could wash it. Uh, as far as Adrian samples, um, we were able to extract the blood, and we also got saliva from an Alabama sample that they had uh, that yielded good DNA. Um, some critics might come at that and say, oh, it's contaminated. Well, yes and no. When you do the whole genome, it's going to show every bit of DNA in it. But what you screen for is we do know by all the thousands and thousands of reports that these things are mammals. They have hair. We have hair samples that are yielding weird results. So they are not an insect. They are not a fish. They are not anything like that. So when we do the species identification test, it's for mammals. It uses what we call universal primers, which means it will test across all mammals. And so uh, when we test the samples, we use that. And if there had been another mammal present in that saliva, if a raccoon had licked it or anything else, it would have shown two separate bands. It would have shown, and my, I've got the video, of course, on my YouTube channel about contamination, and those would have superimposed on our sequencing. And it would have also shown up on our yield gel where we and the species identification gel as two separate bands at different levels. So we knew we had a clean sample mammal, clean mammalian sample, even though it was saliva. Now, there was some bacteria and what have you in it, but that doesn't matter because we're looking for a mammal, not bacteria. It had no effect on the testing whatsoever as a result. And so, like, one of the, the samples we did the whole genome zone was Adrian's. And it was kind of fun because we ended up with a pie chart of what all it contained. And um, <laughs> we, got, we got the bread flour. We got the peanut butter. We got DNA from those organisms it's made from, like wheat. Yeah. And bread flour, wheat, and peanut butter. And actually got a very tiny, we got spinach. And a and a mm. a tiny 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 bit of deer, but it was it was not it was less than one percent. It was like one percent. So that means it it ate deer, it ate spinach, it ate the peanut butter sandwiches they left, and we were able to determine all that, which was really interesting. And I'm not going to release the rest of the results yet, which were the major results. Right. But you know it was very significant. It, but it wasn't mammalian contamination that would affect any of the outcome of the studies and the deer was such a tiny tiny amount that it wouldn't even have shown up on regular sequencing so, so we had to understand a you sample. correctly mel but you're saying if there were human contamination let's say dennis or adrian or any of the people on that project had <laughs> spit on the plate whatever and there, you would have been able to recognize their DNA as opposed to another DNA. Yes, of course. I mean, that's the thing we didn't have, but you know, clean on the on the whole genome nuclear results. We had clean, a clean mammal, and we knew it was already clean because of the mitochondrial results. If there had been any other mammalian contamination of any amount short of this itty teeny teeny bit of deer, there would have been a sizable other band on the gel and it would have superimposed on the sequencing that's why i refer you back to that video i made i actually put pictures up one of them is from the project so you could see how clear it is 
and they're not superimposed. So it was a clean sample, um, even though it had some bacteria and what have you in it, well, and for, a negative for, amount of statistically on the deer. So it, we really gained a lot from it because we were able to see what it was eating also. For those who are not, um, don't have a background in science or, or genetics, can you explain what's the difference between mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA? I thought DNA was DNA. I mean, how does, what's the difference? Okay, there's, there's two types of DNA in any organism uh, that is, you know, sexually reproduces. Um, mitochondria are little organs, little organelles that are in each cell and they produce energy. Uh, they are maternally inherited. You can trace it back all the way to the to the mitochondrial Eve, basically, um, to the one human that it all came from down through the millennia. And the reason that you get mitochondrial DNA from the mitochondria in the cells is because when fertilization occurs, the male mitochondrial DNA is all in the tail of the sperm because it energy it's an energy producing organ. So all of their mitochondrial DNA is in the tail of the sperm. And the minute that the sperm enters the egg, the tail drops off. So all you get from the male is the nuclear DNA. You do not get any of the mitochondrial DNA or a negligible amount can ever be. I mean, it's like you just don't find it. So when you go for the mitochondrial DNA, you get this nice clean picture of female only. And okay. that's outside the nucleus. Now, the nuclear DNA is an equal mix between mom and dad. It's a combination of the male gamete, which was the sperm, the head of the sperm, which contains the, the chromosomes, and the female's egg, which contains her half of the chromosomes. They combine together to create a new organism, and that is a nuclear DNA. So you can trace both dad and mom out of that. And one of the things we actually did in the study was we did a human test called YSTRs. And what that is, that's a test that will trace back male lineage throughout the millennia, the same as the mitochondrial DNA does, because it's on the Y chromosome. And so you take a male sample and you can run that and it will trace back on your male, um, on your father. In so this case, people, it, when people do a DNA analysis of, of typically, are they doing both nuclear and mitochondrial, or is one easier to to analyze than another? Or it depends on what lab they use and what they're looking for. Um, to, like for instance, you can go to some labs and on your ancestry, and they do just the maternal lineage, because everybody has maternal mitochondrial DNA in their cells. Um, of course, the males, you know, they they're not shown up in that, but you can trace your mother's lineage back. Because everybody has an X chromosome. Okay. Um, and so that's the mitochondrial testing that you can go back on your ancestry. But if you want a more complete picture, you can use a company like 23andMe that does nuclear testing. And they go across the whole gamut of male and female. And they can tell you more accurately what your makeup is as far as the um, wh wh where you came from, who you came from. Um, you know, what type of people, I mean, whether you're, you know, Native American or uh, a mixture of Native American and European or you're going to, it's going to show in percentages what you are. So there's, there's, depending on the lab as to what kind of testing you pay for. Okay. And you guys, uh, in my reading, I saw that you did full sequencing on two, three, sample? three, three. Yeah, but I want to go back to the mitochondrial sure. DNA versus the sure. nuclear for just a second. On the Y chromosome, when you do the YSTRs, it will go back to show you where uh, the father's lineage is. I mean, Adrian was one of the samples. He knows his lineage now. Um, oh, Adrian but, had put his own DNA in there? Yeah, too. we used him as one of the control, uh, the okay. positive controls. <laughs> so Adrian and, is not an ape. We know that now. No, no, he's got YSTRs. <laughs> a, small, a small portion. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, when we did this, when we ran the YSTRs on these samples, they did not run well at all. They did not run well at mm. all. They almost didn't work at all. And what we got was either way different than anything that was 
uh, in the literature for human YSTRs, or we got no results at all, or we had just a smattering here or there or beyond that would do an occasional sequence, but it was so minimal that it was very, very significant that whatever the male's progenitor is, it's not human. Hmm. Okay, so uh, I had a, let me just see on my notes here. So some of the, one of the criticisms that was, you know, leveled against the, the genome project was contamination. And, and what I heard you say is that you would wash the samples, particularly hair, um, thoroughly so that anything that was on the hair that could have given another DNA result was washed off. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. You use uh, chemicals and a vortexer, which vibrates at tremendous speed in order to shake loose any cells that would contain DNA that's attached to your sample. And the other way that we knew we weren't contaminated on the on the non-hair samples was once again, we ran the species identification test. And we would have had two bands on them if there had been another mammal in the in the mix okay. and there wasn't and like i say that that tiny tiny little bitty teeny percentage of deer was not even enough to show up and since it was a saliva sample it's an obvious conclusion that less than one percent was deer was not that it actually was in the organism it right. was part of what they ate so um that so for blood or saliva, which you can't wash uh, for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, no, we no ran it on our, by... on our species identification test, and then we okay. sequenced it. And it showed there was no overlap of the sequence. There were no two bands. It's all in the paper. Uh, what you know, how we tested things, and none of them were con were contaminated with a second uh, mammal. So okay. we felt quite confident in going on with it. And Stephanie, could you put up just so people can see the the Sasquatch Genome Project website? If anyone's interested to go look at the the uh, documentation, they can go do that. Um, another another. So one of the things that came out of the study, if, again, if I understand correctly, because I don't claim to be a geneticist, is that uh, in the nuclear DNA, it showed. Um, showed up 15,000 years ago, which a lot of people criticize. Like, how can anything show up 15,000 years ago? That's yesterday in evolutionary terms. So what would you say to that accusation? Okay. These things are hybrids. They are not, I mean, they've made a species unto themselves by this point, but they originally started out as hybrids, human hybrids. So they had to, they had to come into existence after humans came into existence. And we don't know what the progenit male progenitor is. But once again, they had to mate with a human. So it had to be during that time period. Now, when you use the mitochondrial DNA, there's roughly, and you look at the evolutionary side of it, there's roughly one mutation in your mitochondrial DNA uh, in the region we're looking at about every thousand years. So you can take the basic out of Africa original sequence that you would find for a human woman. And every thousand years, you'll get a, a mutation. Okay. And when you get those mutations, you start counting them up. And for each one that you count, you add a thousand years. So when you go and you look the at the average time span for mutations to appear, that's the average. I mean, you can okay. have more or, or less, but basically that's the average. And um, so what we did, plus it's well documented in the literature. There's been a lot of scientific papers written about human mitochondrial DNA, and they will state the, these time frames that I used. And when we looked at it, most of our samples were T2, which is the name of the haplogroup, and that's Middle Eastern. Now, Middle Eastern moved into Europe, and when they did, they mutated again 
and became yet another haplogroup that was younger than the original haplogroup that was Middle Eastern. So the majority of them were Middle Eastern and with, with European in close uh, second. We had an outlier or two that was, that was African, but they're outliers because they were so few. There was only one or two. Okay. Same with Native that. American. We, Adrian, we only yeah, had, I think, two. Comment? No, I was just saying the Alabama one, uh, Melba, had uh, had African in the day. Interesting. Yeah. What was the Alabama sample blood, you said? Saliva. I'm sorry? Yeah. Oh, the sample from Alabama was saliva? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, the Alabama was, was one that we collected in one of our other locations that Adrian and I were working, uh, a repeat visitation to a young couple, young family, and we collected a lot of plates from them that had saliva samples and some hair samples. Okay. So, sorry, Melba, carry on. We're... Well, that's okay. It's just that the bottom line is that most of them were European and Middle Eastern. The rest okay. of them were just outliers, you know, one here, one there that were different from that. Okay. And we didn't have many Native American. We didn't have many um, African. So okay. it was a very, uh, and the other thing about a hybrid, they can actually, actually hybridize up till, you know, recent times there's been reported cases of hybridization, especially in the Native American populations of Sasquatch mating with a stolen uh uh, Native American woman, and I'm sure Randy can attest to that. Um, oh, yeah. And some of them produced offspring. Um, hmm. The genome has they've they've had they've bred out a lot of the human in them because we're the weaker species, and through natural selection over the years, they've become their own species. And there's less human than there was when they first hybridized, so it's probably a lot more difficult for them to actually have viable offspring with a human at this point. But in times past, it wasn't that way, obviously. And like the, the African samples there, somebody put forth a theory in the group that was, that it was possibly uh, maybe a slave several hundred years ago that escaped mm -hmm. and ended up with Sasquatch. And that's where that came from. Not necessarily, you know, from way long ago. We don't know, but we can give you the farthest back it can be by the mitochondrial DNA. Does that make sense? Okay. It does. So um, the um, <laughs> brain. You fire. might let Randy address that if he'd like. <laughs> yeah, sure, Randy. Talk about from the, the Native American side. Talk about the Sasquatch taking the women. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that happened a lot over here in Chehalis on the Chehalis Reserve. It's yeah. near Harrison Hot Springs, and uh, people know where that is. Uh, there's a couple of girls that were taken, and mom was taken to a cave. And she had a baby, and then she was, uh, the Sasquatch brought her back after about a year because she complained she was sick. She was missing her family, and then she had her baby, and of course it died, right? So that's one of the stories there. How, how long ago would that have been? Oh, boy. It was a long time ago. Might have been so the late she, 1800s, early 1900s. So, so the Sasquatch... Maybe? Mated with her. Yeah. That, the Sasquatch yeah. bred with this woman and they, they created an offspring. Mm -hmm. wow. Can't imagine what that was like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some, you know, up in northern British Columbia where I am, just so you know, the, I mean, they were, the, the, you know, back, uh, you know, basically less than 100 years ago in that area, about 75 years ago, the kid, you know, their grandparents had told them, I mean, the, the girls, they cut their hair short so they would look like men because they were, they it was a thing they were scared of. They were stolen. I mean, they would be grabbed by a Sasquatch and they cut their, they kept their hair short so they thought they were men. And that's what, what they did. Yeah. What's amazing is that, that that pairing could create a viable offspring. Um, there was one in the states that happened too. Then that it's the same thing happened, and the the baby didn't survive either. Yeah. Huh. But the reserve right by Harrison Lake, yeah, I know about that, Randy. Yeah, I mean it was. Yeah. People don't want to talk about it, but it happened, and you know yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah. There's quite a few more that people don't even know yeah. about. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, let me let me ask this question of, of the four of you because I um, I've had guests on my show and I've I've read a lot of of uh, documents stating that Sasquatch, some in opposition to this study, some just on their own talking about Sasquatch being a descendant of Gigantopithecus blackie. How would any of you answer that? Ask Melba. Melba? No. Yeah, not in there. You still with us? I don't know. Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, I lost I lost signal for a second. Okay. I just asked about the the uh, you know the the hypotheses that many have put forward that Sasquatch is a descendant of Gigantopithecus. No, uh, Gigantopithecus has now been sequenced and it is um, a predecessor to orangutans. Hmm. And there was no orangutan in the samples in the final analysis. So no, Gigantopithecus is not uh, one of the options. Okay. Is there a fossil record for Sasquatch anywhere? Has anyone found a fossil record? There are, but the government has taken them. Yeah. I had a government I've, whistleblower I've come to me that I've not released yet, and okay. he confirmed a whole lot of things. Hmm. He was dying, and he came right. to me and also confirmed my data was correct. You know, Jim, uh, if I could interject, too. Sure. Uh, and I know probably a lot of people agree with me and Adrian and Randy. My experiences around these things, uh, absolutely a much higher order than any great ape. And more like us, more like people, I felt like those times uh, when I was close and dealing with them, it was almost like you're dealing with a very highly intelligent, mm. uh, just another person. I mean, they seem to know what you're going to do when you're going to do it and uh, very methodical in what they do. So there's definitely a much higher order than I believe, uh, you know, you could accredit to a great ape species. So right. That's my opinion. I, I don't sure. know for sure, but that's my opinion. So. Well, you're, you're certainly entitled to your opinion. Everyone is. Um, and to be yeah, honest, can I interject go ahead, Adrian. People ask me all the time, if they're this big, there's this, and why haven't I seen one? Why haven't this? Why haven't that? And I tell them, if I was covered with fur, so I didn't need, I didn't need for heat for warmth, what I ate, I didn't need to cook. I was, I'm very cognizant that I leave tracks and I'm very careful what I do. And with the night vision that they have is just as <clears throat> their night vision is, in, is incredible. And their sense of smell and everything else is great. With their senses, and I knew if I exposed myself to one human being knowingly, I could get shot. You would never, ever see. You'd never know I existed there. And, mm -hmm. the pe and when you're seeing one, in almost all cases, it knows you're seeing it. It's letting itself be seen. And I mean, the interesting thing was they didn't realize that with night vision, we could see in the fields at night. And that's the only time they cross the openings, you know, at night. Otherwise, it's always in the bush. And that's yeah. the difference. They didn't know we could see them because they're used to people not seeing them at night. Adrian's yep. right about that. They Very haven't caught so. up with our technology yet. <laughs> um, before we take a quick break, as I promised, um, let me just ask Melba, because I want people to be thinking about this for this next part where they're going to ask questions. So the final analysis that you, that, that the study came forward with was if you could just put it into a couple of sentences, what would you say was the final? I haven't released it yet. Oh, you haven't. Because it's, it took a, another year after the study was published. We only published a very small portion of one chromosome. Uh, we had to get bioinformatics done. We had somebody that's probably the best in the world do it. And um, it will be released at the right time. Um, but it was extremely, I did release a little of it tonight in telling you that we got the, the peanut butter and what have you that the thing ate. So, yeah, we got unbelievable data 
from the final analysis. But in, in the paper, you did mention Sasquatch being a hybrid. Yes. Well, that's obvious. And that was that was known as soon as we got any nuclear DNA done, because um, obviously their mitochondrial DNA is human. That means they go back only to humans on their mother's side. They originated with a human female, a regular, normal female, you know, like me or anybody else, it's female. Okay. And uh, but when we did the nuclear side, which shows the daddy's DNA, too, that's when we got all this weirdness, unknown and all kinds of stuff. So that I mean, they are genetically engineered, regardless of how or who did it. They are not something that should be alive. But yet here they are reproducing, having their own species. And I might also point out that re natural hybrids like mules and ligers, um, creatures that are related, like lions and tiger tigers make ligers, they're sterile. They're sterile, yeah. You almost never get offspring. And here these things are way beyond a simple mating like that. And yet they have offspring. I've seen them. Yeah. And so, you know, it's very interesting that these things really, and I said this even before we published the paper, that these things naturally can't exist, but they do. I've seen them. Adrian's seen them. I mean, everybody here has seen them. Yes. And so and we're not all just making this stuff up. And then the DNA supports it. And it supports it in a way that freaks all the scientists out. It freaks everybody out. It was so comforting to have this this uh, whistleblower scientist come forward and confirm everything I'd done. And he had more data than I did in some in, in some areas. He was dying, so he had nothing to lose. And so, you know, I can say without a doubt that they are very different from any hybrid on this planet. And they have been genetically engineered to exist regardless of who or how that was done. Okay. Well, thank you for that quick summary. So what we're going to do is we're going to take five minutes, five minutes only. So everyone stay with us. If you guys need a, a quick potty break, this is time. And let's, let's put up the um, super chat promo and we'll be back in five minutes. Show your support for the Untold Radio Network family of shows and join in on the conversation by using super stickers and super chats on YouTube. Got a question you want answered? Ask it live via a super chat and get real time responses from our shows, knowledgeable hosts and guests. Help keep the Untold Radio Network shows running strong. We need your support. Send your super chats and stickers now.
All right, we are coming back for our second half of our Sasquatch Genome Project Revisited. This is a chance for any of you to ask questions. Some of you have asked questions, and we've made a note of those um, so that uh, any of our guests can answer. Um, my my, those who are with me are laughing at me with this this green because it's green. It looks invisible with the green screen behind me, but it's uh, it's not grass juice. Trust me, it's I don't know what it is, but it tastes pretty good. Green juice. This is not a paid promotional because I don't even know what it's called, but they're laughing at me. So, okay, let's bring our guests back in, and I've got I've got a question for Melba. You back with us okay, now? my audio is really cutting out when you turn the rest of us on. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay. But when we turned it on, it went really bonky. Okay. So here's my question. Obviously, a big part of of any study like the one we've we're talking about, the genome project study, is getting peer reviews, and you've been criticized because you weren't reviewed in a, in a major... I can't understand you. You can't? I'm getting feedback, and I don't know why. Hmm. Um, everything looks good on our end. Can you um, remove the other people just long enough to... We can try that for a second, yeah. Try All that, left. if you would. Okay. All right, I can hear you fine. Okay. So I'm asking about the the peer review criticism that the paper that that you and the others wrote was not reviewed in a major journal, reputable journal, quote unquote. So that's a very important aspect, and that's been a criticism. How would you answer that? Oh, easily. We okay. were accepted to go to peer review on Nature, which is probably the foremost scientific journal in the world. Now, that was quite the achievement because only one in nine papers even makes it to peer review. And they sent it out to these four peer reviewers. And I was a peer reviewer, so I know what I'm talking about here. And what happens is once they accept it and the peer reviewers read it and they don't throw it out and say, no, it's not worth publishing. If they do that, you're done. It never publishes. But if they're going, if they think it's worth publishing, they give their opinions. They send it back and say, we want these things changed or these things done. And we had four reviewers. The first one passed it with minor verbiage changes. The second one didn't read it, but he didn't reject it. He just said he wanted to see the mitochondrial whole genomes. Well, we already had them in there. So we showed him where they were because it was a long paper. The third one made fun of us, actually laughed and said, you mean a human, uh, you know, had sex with, you know, something. And it was a really smart aleck response and very unprofessional, but he didn't reject it. The fourth one said, I want A, B, C, D, E. I want five things. And he named them off and one of them was whole genomes. Because we didn't, have, when we first did the paper, we only did what was enough for species that we did have a new species, like the one that PLOS, another journal did on a monkey, they passed one on a monkey that had only like 3,000 bases and we had 16,000 just in the mitochondrial, not counting the nuclear. Anyway, so what I'm basically saying is they passed the paper with revision. So we came back and we did everything they asked us to because that's how you get it done is you have to satisfy these four reviewers. Okay. So for everything they asked, we went one at a time, addressed them, said, this is how it was. This is how it is now. Now, what they do generally is they'll go ahead and they'll look at it the second time. And if it meets their criteria that they want it done, they pass it. If not, they send it back again and say, well, we want more or we want this, that or the other. So basically, we were well on our way at nature of all places to publish. Now, it took us a while to get the whole genomes. It took us months. So it was a while before we were able to get it back to them. They sent them to the same people, except okay. somebody, probably the government, had gotten to them because 
the first one came back after we corrected everything he wanted and says, oh, I'm not qualified to review this. I went, huh? You passed it before. Why are you suddenly unqualified? The second one, who didn't read the paper, comes back again and says, you don't have any materials and methods in it. Well, <laughs> the editor at Nature had told us to put the materials and methods in a supplemental document, which we gave them because the paper was so long. And it says in the paper to go to this supplement to see the materials and methods. So he once again did not read the paper. The third one, I had complained about his lack of professional review. And he came back and the bottom line was his last parting shot was it's probably contaminated and I just don't believe it. Once again, not professional. I don't believe it shouldn't come into scientific evidence. The fourth one refused to even look at it again. So they didn't publish. So normally what you do, if you don't get one, you, there's a bunch of journals out there. You go to the next journal and you get them to publish it. Okay. We found at every turn, they refused to even look at it or send it for peer review. Now I reviewed PLOS. Now PLOS is one of your lesser journals in that they'll publish nearly everything. And they take, I mean, I know, I've seen papers that had to go five and six times back to get published because there were so many errors. But the science was sort of there, so you go ahead and you make them fix it. Um, they would not even take it for peer review. They refused to even look at it. And I found that was the case with all of these. Mm. And we finally found, and so somebody had gotten to them and said, no, we're not having this paper published. We found a journal that was brand new and apparently it was under their radar. So they had not contacted them and they took it. They had it peer reviewed. It passed. Uh, the editor approved it two hours before they were going to post it online published. The lawyer calls them and I have this in writing. I'm not saying anything I can't back up. They called him and said, don't you do, don't you publish this because it will ruin your journal. It'll ruin your reputation. The lawyer says, do not under any circumstances publish this paper. So I get this email two hours before we're going to turn on the website with it published saying they're not going to publish it. Well, we had, they had peer reviews that we needed. So Wally Herson furnished the money and we just bought the journal. We bought it. And we took exactly what we got from them and we published the paper. We did not alter peer reviews. We did not do anything other than just purchase a journal. We had to rename it as part of the contract. And that was it. So it passed a peer reviewed journal. It passed with flying colors. The editor passed it. But we had to buy it to get it out there. Because we had gone to so many journals and nobody would even look at it. That's right. insane. If Nature would look at it, who's the best magazine out there or the best journal out there, then why in the world would every other little bitty journal and what have you not even look at it? And I'll tell you something else that was out of the ordinary. The peer reviews at Nature got linked to the public. Because one of the people in the Bigfoot world got the leak and went public with it. That was breach of contract. You have to sign a contract that you can't talk about or give out the peer reviews or anything else on a paper. And because they own the copyright once it's all done. But of course, I was able to put it out because they breached their contract. So I posted the peer reviews. People can go on the website and read them. So with that in mind, we were just given the basically the shaft all the way around but we did get it published and it was published with peer reviews that we had nothing to do with we don't know who they were we know nothing but and i've got the documentation where they pulled it out two hours before it's supposed to go live so they can do okay. what they want about it and plus it's also written in the rules that you can self-publish in a journal right but, but the accusation has been the accusation has been, well, that's a conflict of interest because it's your journal. So you could put whatever you wanted in there. And um, Yeah, but we didn't. And I got the written proof. Okay. 
Let's see, Stephanie, what other questions do we have um, for any of our guests here? I understand for Dr. Keshen that the female genome has homo sapien. Does the male genome have matching markers that show relation to each other? Okay. We have not gotten into major comparisons because we were not allowed to upload into GenBank, the big depository for DNA. Right. The government blocked us. We weren't allowed to get it in there to compare them. Um, they, <laughs> that's all documented on the website too, where they ran us in circles. They wanted a signed affidavit of anything human that they released them to publish the genome. Now, how are you going to get a Sasquatch to sign a release? <laughs> that was one of their excuses. <laughs> so uh, we have been blocked from putting it there. Okay. Was was there something that showed the uh, relationship? Well, the fact that they all had a lot of unknown DNA. Okay. I mean, you know, they shared they shared some stuff. Um, yeah. They also did not share some stuff because they're hybrids. Let me explain a little quickly about hybrids. Hybrids, um, sometimes, like in this case, a human hybrid. Some of them will in will get more human traits, while others won't, depending on how. The DNA recombines in the sex um, gametes, the gametes, because, you know, your daddy, he's got two sets of chromosomes, one from mother and one from daddy. Well, say one's blue eyed and one's brown eyed. Well, whatever one he gives is going to affect the offspring. Same on the human side. You got two. So however they recombine and on the male side and the female side combined, it depends on what was dominant and what wasn't. So you're going to get as many different looking Sasquatch as there are people. Right. So that's why they look so different. And a hybridization makes it completely different than a, a straight, steady, normally occurring species where they're all very similar. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. There was another question that you guys, uh, Stephanie threw up there. Did any of the blood samples reveal an RH factor? We did not have the funding to go after RH factor. Okay. That's actually, quick actually, we are revisiting this study at this time, and we are raising money to do this. We've made enough to actually get the DNA done, but we don't have any extra money to do things like RH factor. Anybody wants to contribute, we can get RH factor, but we have yeah. to have more money than what we've been able to raise to do it. Here's the GoFundMe for this particular uh, continuation that uh, Melba is doing. If anyone is interested, you can go to this cryptogenome project. And by the way, Adrian's got three samples in it. Okay. Not Adrian samples, but other samples. <laughs> no, Adrian has. To, well, yeah, Adrian's already been done. We're finished with Adrian as far as his DNA. <laughs> Adrian, Adrian's been analyzed. Well, okay. unique species, yeah. <laughs> um, Neanderthal. Wild, wild, wild man part two. <laughs> yes. Didn't Melba I come can... back mostly Neanderthal? <laughs> yeah, Neanderthal. Uh, Adrian's going to be a caveman. You're too tall for that. You tall for that. <laughs> <laughs> he came back part giant. <laughs> part giant. Okay. Um, what? I'm not sure I understand this question. Maybe you all will. What was the de novo sample number of the Kentucky blood sample? I'd have to go back and check the numbers. Okay. Because I don't have it in front of me right now because I'm on okay. this. All right. Fair enough. They can go to my website. Supplement one on the paper it has all the numbers of the samples, who collected them, where they came from, etc. Okay. Can you see these questions? Can you all see these questions? Yeah. On the screen? Yeah. With the glasses. Okay. <laughs> Does the male DNA show relationship? to each other, child, parent, siblings, cousin, second, third, et cetera, as a species over the samples across the country in Canada. Oh, I assume you mean were the species linked in any way, the, the, the blood samples, were they linked in any way genetically? That's what we're going after more in this second study in a much broader level is relatedness. Uh, we're hoping that we can somehow there's another database that's sprung up 
we're hoping we can get the samples uploaded there and do a lot of different comparison. Once again, that's going to take more funding than we have right now to do a major job on that, but we would like to because we can discover all kinds of things about relatedness. On I'm going after just some basics with this study. Our, but have been, I feel sure there will be in the unknown sequences, I feel sure there will be relatedness. Have there been other studies done? I'm just curious for any of you, any other studies done since before or since your study? on Before there's been, a, there's been a huge study before us. Uh, that had more data than I did, but I had the more recent data. And uh, I will be bringing that out. Uh, it's amazing. Can you say whether it it agrees or disagrees with your findings? No, he publicly went forward before he died and said that what I had matched what he had. Okay. Interesting. What primer do you predates use? Us. It predates us by years. Okay. It was a long-term study with multiple scientists. And has anything been done since in the past 10 years? Oh, there's been some pieces here and there, yes. Okay. Um, but, you know, this other was much more significant. Question from Dr. Graham. Uh, what primer do you use in Bigfoot DNA amplification, especially when working with nuclear DNA? Okay. A primer is just like bookends that select a, a particular sequence. Okay. And what we did in the paper is we developed universal primers. Some were already in the literature, like the species ID primers. But we developed, uh, for some different genes, we developed primers to get sequences on these things. Um, and they were all universal primers. And universal primers means that we designed them, we took, so that they would amplify all the mammalian species that we have in GenBank, basically, in the database. So any mammal on this planet pretty much at this point is in the database. Right. And our primers would amplify them, and we could go in and find out what species it was. And that's why we did it that way. And what we, how we got those particular genes we looked at, we did a 250 million single nucleotide polymorphism chip, which means basically point mutations where there's one sequence off uh, at a particular base. I'm not the, I'm sorry, the sequence is off at one base between different individuals. So we found, for instance, the skin coloration, the entire group, none of them would amplify on that SNP for skin color. So we went in and we developed these universal primers for skin color. And they still would not amplify even a sequence. So their skin color gene is very different from any other mm -hmm. mammal on the planet. They have like gray skin, but of course, you know, other things have some gray skin like your apes, but this is different because the apes would run and they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, so we were very careful about using universal primers so that we could you know, we already knew from species identification these things were, were pure samples. And they would have shown up as an animal if they were an animal that is on this planet. And they did not on some of these markers we went after. And the skin color was the most blatant one. I have a question I was going to ask Randy as well. Oh, and by the way, that's not in the paper because nature told us that they didn't want negative results in the paper, even though they're very significant in this case. Okay. Um, Dennis and Adrian, I'm just curious because, because where, where this conversation is going in terms of the study points to, uh, Sasquatch being at least partially human and you, in your experience with Sasquatch, what traits would you say came across to you as more human than great ape, for instance? What things did you observe that you could say, well, that, that, that did not seem like a great ape behavior? The ability, I think Dennis brought it up to, to anticipate what we would do. I mean, you've talked to Dave Polites. I mean, they just dance circles around them. People try to get game cam pictures of them. They have a different, they have like, they have a, an extra sense that we don't have. And, uh, you know, they're just, 
they're just their intelligence and then you know how they've you know their survival instincts of how they can basically just elude us Dennis did you what have you observed that that made you start to think there was more human in them uh well you know as Adrian said it's you know you you think that you'd have a situation like we were in which I think we were very lucky to to be a part of and it's very unique and I know there's others going on out there that um, have ongoing situations like ours mm -hmm. but you cannot predict or think you're going to get ahead of these guys or set up a camera pointing over here because you saw them come over here last time and you're going to get them one of these times because they're 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 moving constantly they are predicting ahead of time what we may do so they're they're thinking on a level that's much more uh, and it's much different than any any animal any typical animal bear or anything else you deal with in the woods and uh i know in my experiences out there i've, I've heard them use i believe it was a language i mean mm. I, it was unintelligible to me but communication that way um they know how to communicate with one of the uh, people we were working with over there, the, the, the lady that had this long-term experience. And those communications were a communication like, you know, a person would try to do this trying to signal to another person. It's, it's just you know, a lot of nuances, a lot of things that just so that you're not dealing with anything close to an animal or anything that, um, you know, that it, it is, these things speak on a higher order. So, I mean, it's just, it feels like you're dealing with, with a human being when you're out there. And um, again, I know a lot of people can attest to that, that's been close to them, or, you know, that's been in, in similar situations to us. So, uh, well, there's, you know, may there's, I interject? Go may ahead. I interject? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, I have them. I've been within five feet of them. Uh, they understand us when we speak. They are sentient beings. They were breaking the branches. They like to watch. They were breaking the branches out of one of my pecan trees. It made me mad. I went outside just a storming about it, saying, you know, why ah, did you break all the limbs out of the top of the thing? The next morning, there was an X made of bone placed at the base of that tree. Two little exactly matching bones. I took pictures. And they never broke another branch out of that tree. Hmm. Yep. So, and that's not the only thing I had to correct. Sure. So, yes, they're sentient yeah. beings. They understand well, I our, to, our thoughts. I can attest to one situation, Jim, where um, yeah. I'll make it real brief. But sure. Uh, one of these, one of the evenings we were out, one at night, we were out in the field, and uh, just one of these times that we just happened to get a very uh, active encounter that evening, and I know there are several of them around there, but we were way in the back of a, of a field, just inside the tree line, and I was doing everything I could to try to get some footage, because I could hear them just 20, maybe 20 yards back into the trees. But if you've been in Kentucky and any time in the spring and summer and early fall, it's just uh, it, it's as, as thickly overgrown as any place you'd ever see. It's just like a jungle. So even with the, the equipment I had, it was very difficult to try to get, you know, see anything back there. So I actually worked my way out of the tree line and went out into the open. And I was uh, filming back towards the uh, the tree line, and I could hear one of them right up against the tree line. I know they were watching us, and as Melba said, this one was breaking branches. And at one point, I heard I had been pressuring them. I'd been pressuring them with a the camera on them and trying to get footage. And I got this sense of it had had enough of me being there. I mean, I'm talking 15, 20 minutes of this going on. And it signaled, it told me. And it told me by it sounded like taking an open palm or a hand and thumping uh, a large limb coming off of an oak. And it thumped it three times. 
and I continue to film, and then it broke a branch, and the signal is, okay, that's enough. You know, I've had enough. It's time for you guys to leave, and I got that message right away. And even me pressuring trying to get that footage, I know that it comes to a time where, you know, the communication is, you know, I'm pushing it. It's too much. And, uh, yeah, I turned the camera off, and I, I we left. And, uh, yeah, you know, I hate to do that, but sure. they can communicate in that way. And you just know when, when enough is enough and, and they let you know that. So, well, one, one criticism that, that I know was directed towards me, but towards you guys eventually was the juvenile that was filmed during the Erickson project. Um, people have called it a Chewbacca mask. And, May I uh, address that, please? Before the <laughs> let me let let me let these guys, and then I'll I'll let you. Okay. What what would you guys say, Adrian or Dennis? Well, you, again, you, and, you and uh, you and uh, Leela did a did a size comparison. You did a bunch. Dennis, go ahead. Yeah, no, I don't believe it was the juvenile. I believe it was one of the was, uh, larger females. One of the females, yeah. and, the, and the head shape was similar to what I'd seen. And it was definitely not a smaller one, but uh, that one was taken before I got involved with the project. And it was taken by, the video was taken by the woman who was involved. And there's a story behind how she got that. And I don't you know, want to, I know we've got limited time, but it's pretty interesting. But she was able to capture that footage um, by being camouflaged against a tree down in an area where they put food regularly. And that's something that they never did. She was always in the open, always standing out talking to them. So I believe the element of all what they did that day helped them to capture the footage. It just wasn't expecting her to, to go, to be so different and, you know, hide like she did. But, uh, yeah, it was a, it, it was a pretty remarkable piece of footage. And, and early on when I got involved with the project and our scientist, our on-site scientist, Leela uh, Hotchek, she and I took it upon ourselves to uh, look that footage over pretty carefully. And uh, we compared, I know we spent some days comparing everything we could find available out there in the world uh, that was, you know, duplicate of the Chewbacca map. Because we had heard that criticism too. Sure, I'm sure. And um, she used a lot of methods to over, you know, to impose over what we had as still shots and profiles with any mask out there, and, and we could really discern um, the masks were just so different in so many ways, and there was a whole variety of them, and nothing we saw could come close to. Mm the intricacies and the details that we were able to pull out of that piece of footage. And it was shot on standard definition camera, right, Adrian? It wasn't high depth yeah. time that she photographed it or videotaped it. But we were still able to determine that a lot of the things did not line up. And okay. um, some of the details, as we said, chronicism, that's the jutting of the low, upper and lower jaw, was a lot more prominent. and um, the teeth even inside. I guess I could let Adrian talk about that, but we thought for several years one of the one of the uh, the teeth uh, they call the lateral incisors was uh, dead. And in fact, um, what we did find in comparison is that it actually um, projects inward to allow the lower uh, incisor or uh, I don't know what they call it. I can't remember. It's been a few years, but a mandible to come in and place itself so it can fully close its mouth. So it was a, it was a gap. A lot of people wouldn't even. Yeah, it was a gap on the top that the tooth would fit into. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing that people, you won't find that in mass. You won't find that in a static and the, mass that doesn't move. And uh, the tongue. There's just, the and tongue, the tongue is just, is just anybody that's seen, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, I'm not saying animal color, but it's a grayish yep. different, a different colored tongue. And it's just, it's not, like these yeah. mouse, whatever. Mel Melba, yeah. what would you say to that question? I have waited this whole two yeah. hours to yeah. answer this. <laughs> anyway, we're this pretty is going to prove it for them. Yeah, I have no idea. Confident. Go ahead, Dennis. Oh, I was just going to finish what I was going to say. Is 
we're, we're confident that that was not anything available out there. And I know that okay. the people we we're dealing with were not sophisticated enough nor talented enough to produce something on their own that could be such a highly refined mask, let alone my experiences there afterwards. What I saw in profile and straight on with my own eyes when I was doing these creatures, I, it, it was very similar to that. So I believe it was one of the females there. It, so anyways, that's... It was the young one. It was one of the females. Yeah. Okay. Melba? All right. First of all, I'm going to say I've seen two of these creatures in daylight that look just like her. Mm -hmm. Had the haired face. They look just mm -hmm. like Chewbacca. And mm -hmm. the thing about it is that I don't believe for a second that George Lucas, either he saw one or he ha knew somebody that saw one because he said he did it after his dog. His dog has a long nose and it's black and white. And that thing looks just like them, though. The Chewbacca looks just like these things pretty much, except for the Dennis, what Dennis said. Now, with that said, I don't care if anybody believes me or not, but the DNA doesn't lie. We did DNA on this creature. And we tested for the red hair gene. And she is auburn colored. And she was positive for the red hair gene. She was a female. We only had two or three females in the study. And so that was significant. The third thing was we tested her on the skin color gene. And, of course, she would not run because she was a Sasquatch with a sequence that will not run on mammalian universal primers for skin color. When you do the statistics on it, especially with that last part, it's infinity that she could be anything other than real. Well, so the DNA an supports that it's a real, that. real creature. Yeah. Well, as you as you guys said, well, um, to create a mask like that would have taken some doing to make it look convincing enough, um, even though it 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 bare it bore some resemblance to to Chewbacca. But um, you know that could have just been coincidence. It's it's very similar to people who accuse Patterson and Gimlin of creating a gorilla suit. They didn't have the money. They didn't have the know-how. They didn't have, no one had the technology to do that in 1967. So, well, they didn't, sure enough didn't have the technology to do the DNA. No, <laughs> certainly not. So, I do have to say that the description of those, those younger, the younger one and the two uh, females were similar in terms of the hair covering on the body was very different very thick and including the face but the, the, the male you know Adrian you remember uh, you know or their associate talking about that who actually had a you know very up close sighting had the typical no hair here under the eyes the forehead yeah. was there yeah. and yeah. more like a heavy beard mm -hmm. than you know the rest of it covered in hair pretty good so that one was described to be more of a less hair on the body the male was than the, than the two females but it says melba said earlier we have to expect variations on these species they're not going to all look like the, they're not going to all look the same they're not going to all be the same colors right. the same hair densities and all that uh, they're not going to all look like patty they're not going to have a conical head and you know they're they're just and people have to accept the fact that these variations are going to occur in a natural species, like any bell curve. Am I right, Melba? I mean, that's that's what you're going to impress on people anyway. A hybrid is going to have more variation in appearance than a striped species. Even though they've, they've become a species, they are still originally hybrids. And because of the recombination, and the stresses of the environment, and Adrian has a good story about a pig on that one, um, <laughs> that if there's enough environmental pressure, the species will adapt and it will change. And in this, this case, like I say, a lot of the human has actually been bred out of them because we are the weaker species on the nuclear side. Not so, half human and half Sasquatch like I would have thought. Sure. So this question... Um, the whole genome analysis were performed on samples 26, 31, and 140. Do you guys happen to remember 
what the backstory was on those samples. Was was yours one of those, Adrian and Dennis? The genome was the uh, you did the you did the genome uh, on the gray one, the gray one, yeah. the Alabama sample. Was that one of those three that's listed? Yes. Okay. Do you happen to know the backstory on the other two? Where yeah. They, what 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 is the story? Where did they come from? Um, one of them was a controversial sample because I think the government scared the man. Uh, but he shot it. And <clears throat> the other one um, was from a pipe that had been chewed. We had to use the samples that had the most DNA because at the time, now they've got new techniques, but at the time, they had to have a good bit of DNA to do the whole genomes because um, they have to amplify it up a lot. And so they needed to start with a higher percentage than what we had in our hair samples. And we'd used a lot of it up too because of the testing. Um, that's one reason we're revisiting it with this new project. We're gonna do some of the Sasquatch samples because now they're, they need almost no DNA to get the whole genomes. I mean, they've got it down to where they can amplify up even the most ancient of remains and still get DNA. So we're not gonna have any problems with, we're gonna use hair this time because we know we can have it so perfectly clean and get some more samples done because of that. And the other samples are like Adrian had the bone samples and teeth samples, or they're all three teeth samples actually. And we're going to use those. Um, they've already been prepared partially to, to be tested. Was and so, uh, one of those three the skunk pipe? No. No. Okay. Okay. Any any last um let's look at my moderators here. Any last questions that uh we can ask? What happened to Matilda? So who's Matilda? You're gonna have to explain that. Go ahead, you guys. Go ahead, Adrian. Well, go ahead, Dennis. Dennis, go ahead. Uh, Matilda, I think, is the one we affectionately uh we call Matilda is uh one of the three females, uh, there's a juvenile, as I said at the beginning, which at the time when we started, we believed to be four foot, four and a half foot tall. Um, and then the other two were six, around six foot. Um, and to this day, we're not sure. We know that, you know, when we ended the project, they were still doing their thing there, but mm -hmm. it's very limited access for anybody. It's all private land. Um, you know, the, the people living there were doing their thing and we kind of just, once we got the DNA and we started on that path, uh, Adrian and I agreed we were going to focus in on that and that we had come to a point where we really couldn't continue working on the location anymore. And um, so we were relying on the DNA study to, you know, help bolster everything else that we had collected, you know, the video and the audio and uh, footprint cast and other score that we collected over the time. And then uh, our on-site scientist, Leela, moved uh, back uh, home and I kind of uh, did a lot of work in, in Canada and with, uh, with Randy. I went back and forth with him and we did a lot of outings and then um, so we kind of more or less sunsetted it and left it as it was. And then at some point uh, we did bring in uh, about a year after that, after we ended that, we brought in another highly qualified researcher who picked up just to, so we put her in the same location that we were doing a lot of the research at the house. We still had the house, had possession of the original home. And we set her up and she spent I can't remember if it was a year or two years, and it might have even been a little longer there, but she stayed there because she was also being a woman and being in, in the same age group as the uh, as, as the original subject that we were working with. Um, we were wanting to see if some of those experiences would replicate with her and maybe there would be some sort of uh, relationship that she could build mm -hmm. with this family group. And she did to a certain extent, and did a really good job. She had experiences there as well. Uh, but I guess that's for another time. But more or less, it kind of just sums, 
sunsetted and uh, we we uh, just kind of you know what it is today and uh, it is what it is. Anything else to add, Adrian, that I missed? No, no, that was uh, <laughs> that's about it. I mean, it was just it's one of those things that it went its course and it was yeah. Uh, uh, the you know my my financial situation did not allow it to continue any further and uh, you know and it was uh, it was trying it was especially trying on Dennis but it was just dealing with these people was not easy and it was just yeah these things don't you know remember I mean we just thought when we saw what was going on when Dennis got there the first night there I mean the first night he had this thermal imaging thing and the young the juvenile her her talking came out. You know, in the in the yard light was like fifteen or eighteen yards away, and and then when Dennis and I finally got the proper footage of it on the pancake, and we thought in a year we're going to have this and that, so right away we think we're going to we go and clear it out so we can get another camera in there. Nice, bingo. <laughs> They're gone. We were, yeah, we were pretty naive. We thought it would be easy, but uh, yeah. no, by far not at all. Yeah. Which, I mean, there's a lot of missed opportunities, a lot of a lot of things that we look back and really puts a dot on the book in your stomach, you know. You you wish you would have done things different, you know, and uh, but it, again, you know, for as many times as we were successful, I can tell you probably ten times we missed opportunities we wish we were better prepared for. But, you know, it's just it's just part of part of the whole the whole thing is it's not easy it's just not yeah. easy no matter yeah. what well no, my not. experience if we if you don't take a camera they come out a lot better to you yeah when i've gone out i've had all kinds of experiences with them and gotten very close to them but mm -hmm. um uh, it's yeah. always without a camera i never take a camera with me for that reason because they will not show up randy have you gotten footage in the past of them a few times yeah two times yeah. how did you manage to do that it was tough. I had a kind of a habituation thing going on there for a few years. Kept it pretty quiet. And uh, they'd come around, you know, and I'd leave all kinds of little peanut butter jars, salmon in the jars. So they have to unscrew the lid, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Because you don't want to just leave something out, any, anything you take it, you know, raven, bear, whatever. But uh, yeah, they'd come around and I'd be like the first one in there and the last one out at night. So I knew I was the only one going to this one area in the morning and at night. And uh, I go back to. I got to give it to Randy. I think he's the only one of us that's still really active doing this, and I commend him for that. Yeah, we still go out, but we keep it a lot quieter now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, well, for good reason, I think. Yeah. Um, you learn, you yeah. learn over time how how overt to be about these these things. So, mm -hmm. uh, any trust. any last questions, or are we good, ladies? One more, maybe. Mind speak. Hmm. I figured that was going to come up sooner or later. Um, any of you ever experienced that? What what people would consider calling it mind speak? I, I have. Yeah, I have. No. No comment. No comment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a strange for those who don't know what it means. It's basically the concept that telepathy. Mm -hmm. Telepathy. Sasquatch can put things into your head yeah. or in into your they heart. Can, they can they can yeah. impart fear into you. They can impart fear into you. They can impart fear. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they throw energy I, and it will zap you and put yeah. you on the ground. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I mean, I'm not a yes to that question that someone posted. That have you ever seen orbs? Yeah. Yeah. I can say mm -hmm. I yes, I've seen orbs. Witnessed that something I. I would never even begin to understand what I saw or why, but I did on the property several times. I saw orbs, and it, uh, yeah, absolutely strange phenomena. Yeah. Did you I think at the time they were, they were related to Sasquatch somehow, or I do because mm -hmm. the time I saw it, it was it was directly um, after a visual sighting we had that same evening. We were out working our area and we we had rocks thrown at us we had noises coming from the wood the, the tree line and then shortly after that i had put up a uh a p 
PBS 14 night vision and I was trying to capture some video and I saw an orb floating through the tree in the inside the tree line, floating maybe two, three feet off the ground. And it, you know, how people describe fairies, just a lazy, slow yeah. moving. It, it, yep. I That's can't right. Tell you what, what it was, but I saw it. Yeah. Randy, well, have you seen that? Uh, yeah, yeah I, saw, I saw in, yeah. in, in Kentucky and then two different occasions here in Colorado during, during one of our expeditions. Mm -hmm. uh, we did see some strange disembodied lights that, uh, you know, all I can describe would be orbs. I, yeah, but not rarely. It's not like all the time. Right, see. right. Dennis saw uh, the same thing I did. Uh, now, the person we were working with, Adrian and I, um, the, the, the guy that was there that, that was married to the woman, he told me once he was staring right at one that was approaching him, and he had hidden himself trying to capture footage when, one afternoon, so it was still daylight, and he said that he had, had a camera with him, which made sure he was always outfitted with something, right? And he said this thing was approaching him at the bottom of this of a draw of this uh, hollow and he could see it coming right at him and he was waiting for it to get close to try to capture some footage and he said the the second he took to lift the camera and turn the camera on he had it on standby to push the button on the camera um, and start recording he had looked into the eyepiece to frame it and when he looked into the eyepiece he didn't see it so he took his eye off the eyepiece to look where he had just seen it walking towards him, and he said it was gone. Hmm. And uh, he he came back to Fuddle, and he said, I can't tell you what happened. I just, and I told him, I, I don't know what to tell you either. I mean, it was there one second, and then it was gone the next. And he didn't have any footage, but um, that was a strange thing, too. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. I've well, seen footage uh, that somebody got on a game cam of one that actually you see its shoulder and then you see the orb and the orb in each consecutive picture goes and sits on a tree branch. <laughs> I've personally seen two. They're about the size of a cantaloupe and what Dennis described, they move very slowly. Mine were going parallel to the ground hmm. and yeah. they were moving very slowly and they were about the size of a cantaloupe. They were both red. Yeah. Ours was about, uh, I would say the one I saw was about the size of a golf ball in Kentucky, and the other one was probably a little smaller, maybe the size of a quarter, but it was very brief. Um, but like, again, you know, like, I don't know what that was. It just illuminated itself in the woods, and, and it was gone. So Yeah, I don't know that it was a Sasquatch either. I just know that I've seen two of them, sure. and it was really weird because it was so slow just floating along. Yeah, exactly. Well, listen, I'm going to uh, bring our discussion to a close. I just want to thank each of you for taking a couple hours of your precious time to to be with us on the Sasquatch Outpost podcast. Um, I've learned some things this evening. I hope our, our audience has. Um, I appreciate you trying to answer these questions uh, honestly and openly. And... Um, Melba, we'll look hey, it was forward great to seeing y'all, you guys. By the way, yeah, yes, yeah. well, I, we didn't see your face there, Melba. <laughs> oh well, go to my Facebook. I got a, a recent I picture don't go on there. Facebook. You send me an email. You send me your. <laughs> okay, I'll send you a picture on an email. <laughs> that'll, that'll have to be a post interview uh, engagement there. So, yeah, well, it's great seeing you, Dennis. We gotta we'll catch up again. Yeah, you're still young. Yeah, you're, you're young. You look like a boy. You don't, you hardly Dennis look. Dennis is a baby. Like He's still a baby, Dennis. Dennis. Oh, you sure? <laughs> I don't feel like well, I'm going to say that Randy <laughs> hasn't aged much. Randy has not aged yeah. much himself. Not at all. He looks I'm good too. Everybody looks that. good. Yeah. I think well, 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 Sasquatch well, has been good to all of us. There you go. There you go. Adrian, I'll come up to Canada to see you and Randy. Yeah. Well, take care, guys. Yeah. Take care, Randy. Yeah. Appreciate you being with us. They will bail you out. Don't worry. I think my we'll thing's cutting out here. Okay. Jim, thank you for having us. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you all yeah, for being with us. Jim. And uh, yeah. for those who are with the podcast uh, next week, I have um, 
Let's see who do I have next week. <laughs> um, Laura Krantz. So she she was the one who initiated the Wild Thing podcast a few years ago, where she went around the country exploring um, uh, sightings and stories. Um, she's distantly related to Grover Krantz, so should be an interesting interview. But thank you guys for being with us. Look forward to next week, and uh, until then, stay safe.